By now you probably already know what you're looking at. The image of the Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. The iconic image that was only released to us a few weeks ago, and the image that created quite a lot of buzz in the scientific community. But getting this image, or even knowing where to look for this particular black hole, is actually quite an interesting story. Something that started roughly around 90 years ago, when the scientists realized where the center of our galaxy most likely is located. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video, let's discuss the brief history of the discovery of Sagittarius A star, the black hole that's probably going to get some kind of a better name very soon, and what we've learned about this particular location in space in the last few decades. And I guess let's start with the original discovery of the center of the galaxy itself, something that the scientists have known for almost a century now. And as you probably know by now, in the early 1900s, and here we're talking about until around 1920s, 1930s, our view of the universe was very limited. As a matter of fact, most scientists believed that our universe was just this, the galaxy known as the Milky Way. With all the formations we see around, most likely being different clouds, different types of nebula, and different types of structures. And so it wasn't really until 1930s and the investigations from the iconic Edwin Hubble that we finally figured out that other galaxies exist and the universe is much, 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 much bigger. And so a lot of scientists became interested in discovering the center of our own galaxy because they realized a lot of other galaxies seem to have very interesting, very active centers. And they managed to get a rough estimate of the center by looking at the motion of various global clusters, such as this one known as Omega Centauri, as they essentially orbit around some kind of an invisible central point somewhere in our own galaxy. But trying to see exactly where they orbited was very, very difficult. And you can kind of see in this simulation why. There's just way too much dust everywhere. It's almost impossible to see anything through this. And so because of this cosmic dust, early observations were extremely limited. The general area was kind of known, but not really precisely. And so because of all of this dust, there's this whole region located in between us and the center of the galaxy that presents us with a bit of a problem. We are unable to see what happens behind this. And this is actually where a lot of really interesting things are, including the region of space with a mysterious great attractor. Today this area is known as the zone of avoidance. And somewhere inside the zone is the Milky Way's black hole. And the dust here is really, really thick. As a matter of fact, pretty much no optical light goes through it. So almost everything becomes invisible. But that's only optical light. Some light does get through. For example, X-rays. Also, radio light. As a matter of fact, radio waves go both through dust and the Earth's atmosphere, making the radio observations from planet Earth very, very accurate. And this is where this wonderful person, Karl Jansky, comes in. In 1930s, he created the world's first radio telescope, what you see right here. And by using his radio telescope, he was able to discover something unusual happening in the constellation of Sagittarius. And if you were to look at this from Earth's perspective using the map that we have right here, it's essentially somewhere right there. Now, somewhere in this constellation, he detected quite a lot of radio emissions. And so in 1933, the early astronomers realized that what they're looking at is most likely the center of our own galaxy. This unusual bright radio spot at the edge of the Sagittarius constellation could not really be anything else. It was the brightest spot that appeared to be in the region very, very close to where they thought the center would be. And because this was the first such spot discovered, they named it Sagittarius A. Although it wasn't until 1954 and this paper that you see right here, that the scientists officially identified Sagittarius A as being a very bright radio source in 250 megahertz. But the later observations and more precise observations uncovered that there are several bright components inside Sagittarius A. And that's of course on top of other radio sources such as Sagittarius B, Sagittarius C, and so on. You can see some of them in this image right here. But inside Sagittarius A there was an unusual and very compact, extremely bright spot. A spot that was discovered in February of 1974. With all of this being done by a baseline interferometer part of the NRAO, also known as National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And because this was such an unusual discovery and such an exciting discovery, they used the same convention as in other fields of science such as chemistry and put a little asterisk next to it. And so it became known as Sagittarius A asterisk or Sagittarius A star. And the reason this was so exciting of a discovery is really because of how compact the spot was and how energetic it was in producing the radio emissions that were being observed. 
Although officially the asterisk was assigned in 1982 by Robert Brown, who in this paper right here explains that this was the strongest radio emission from the center of the galaxy and appeared to be due to some kind of a very small, yet not very hot, radio object. And that's essentially when all of this became quite apparent. All of this implied that there was some kind of a black hole-like object present in this region. But it was really because of the new inventions in the 70s, specifically radio interferometry, that all of this became possible and all of this became a reality. And we'll actually talk a little bit more about interferometry in some of the other videos, but in a nutshell, instead of using one single dish, it becomes possible to use several smaller dishes, point them at the same direction, and then use the idea of interferometry or the idea of superposition or positioning same frequencies over each other to dramatically enhance a frequency of observations and basically make the amplitude much higher, making a distant image much easier to see. And once these initial studies came out, that's when a lot of scientists became interested in trying to figure out exactly what's happening in the middle and what sort of a black hole we have there, or if it is a black hole. For example, this 1994 study determined that the mass of this object was very likely approximately 3 million masses of the Sun. They did so by using various infrared and submillimeter telescopes and essentially looking at the overall mass distribution in this particular region. But the biggest breakthrough came in 2002 from an international team of scientists led by the Max Planck Institute and this wonderful person known as Reinhard Genzel. With that team doing something that was never done before, looking at the central region and trying to find out if something is moving here and specifically looking for the motion of different stars. And they managed to find one star that was really interesting. The star that we usually refer to as S2, one of many S stars in this region. By observing this star for approximately 10 years, they were able to quite definitively say that this was some kind of a massive black hole object and not something else. Not, for example, some kind of a massive cloud object or anything that's more unusual like dark matter. More importantly, the motion or very fast motion of S2 and other nearby stars very close to the center here made it even possible to determine the total mass of the object in the middle. The initial calculations showed it to be 4.1 million solar masses within a relatively small volume as well. Something that was very likely the size of the entire solar system that we live in. So basically this was not some kind of a large cluster of stars or unusual objects. And I guess one of the more surprising discoveries back then was the fact that S2 was orbiting really fast at the closest point to the black hole, approximately 2.5% the speed of light, nearly 8000 km per second. Although in one of the recent videos that you might be able to find somewhere right there or in the description, we've talked about another star that seems to beat these records as well. Although furthermore, by monitoring a lot of other stars in this region, after 16 years of observations, the mass was re-estimated to be about 4.3 million masses of the Sun, with the official announcement being done back in 2008. And within just a few years after that, in 2014, they also discovered some other interesting objects, such as these G objects that we now know exist there as well. These seem to be stars, but they also seem to be clouds. And it's essentially stars that seem to fall apart and then recombine into very massive objects once again. But then in 2015 we saw something else coming from the region here. Very powerful X-ray flares making the object approximately 400 times brighter than usual. Once again confirming that this is very likely a black hole and nothing else, but also suggesting that some of these G objects that passed close to the black hole might have lost some of their mass that then fell into the black hole creating the powerful emissions we're observing from planet Earth. And I guess one of the most recent discoveries was really in regards to these proposed jets that were observed coming from the center as well. Something that was discovered only a few months ago from when I'm making this video, and something that once again you can learn more about in one of the videos right there or in the description. But we were still missing that one final piece of evidence, an actual image. And the story here starts in 2017, when the team behind the Event Horizon Telescope was finally able to find a perfect month and perfect time to observe the central region of our own galaxy and to try to take a picture of the black hole. This was in April of 2017. And the main reason why it was so difficult to find a perfect moment was actually because of the weather. Because HD has several different telescopes in different locations around the planet, they actually all had to find a perfect time when there was no major weather interference in the atmosphere, because generally certain atmospheric effects can produce a lot of interference when observing even radio frequencies. 
And so in order for all of these telescopes to take the same picture of the same area of space, they had to come up with a lot of different models and a lot of different types of processing had to be done as well, such as, for example, removing potential atmospheric turbulence. And they also had to account for all of the dust located between the black hole and us and remove any potential interference this creates as well. Gas does produce certain radio frequencies and those radio frequencies can interfere with final observations. On top of this, the scientists knew that our black hole is much less massive and so the things here move much faster. And so trying to combine several hours of observations into a single picture would simply not really work. And so instead they divided all of their observations that happened over a period of several days into fragments of few minutes each from every single telescope. And the reason it took them so long to produce the image is because all of this then had to be processed with each of these chunks processed separately. And once the processing was done, they then had to kind of come up with an average image to see what's actually happening here. So really the data processing and the analysis took the longest. The actual observations did not take very long. And in the end, the processing resulted in the image that we see today. Although once again, as I mentioned in the video about the black hole, this is not really a picture that we think of when we take a picture with our phone. This is more of an inferred image based on the statistical analysis of various observations done over several days and over several runs, with many of them producing several images in the process which were then combined into one. But nevertheless, still quite impressive, and I'm sure we'll learn so much more about all of this in some of the future studies. And so that's the general history of how we went from just knowing that there's something in the middle to getting an image that was created using a very complex analysis. Definitely super impressive and definitely will lead to a lot of exciting discoveries in the next few years. But we're actually going to be discussing something else about this image and several studies that even disagree with this particular technique with a video maybe on the channel somewhere already that you can maybe find in the description below. On that note, thank you for watching, we'll definitely come back and talk about this more, so subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.